I love data and information, all kinds of data and information, numbers, ideas, words, statistics, and visualizing that data and information in graphical images that anyone can understand. And then I like to go a step further and design that visualized data and information so that it reveals something interesting or allows us to focus on what's important in the sea of data that surrounds us or maybe drowns us. Or design it so that it tells a story. That's the data journalism part. And I think when you do that, when you gather data, you analyze it, you visualize it, you design it, you tell a story with it, strange and interesting and even quite magical things can start happening to data and information. So today I want to talk about the particular powers of data visualization, what data visualization has to offer for decision makers, policymakers, the public, and so on. I'm going to give you some examples, and hopefully by the end you'll agree with me that data visualization is beautiful. While data visualization is beautiful, what it's been showing us recently in the last couple of years has not been beautiful. In the last two years over the pandemic, there's been a data visualization on every single newspaper front page, every single TV news report, every single uh, website news report. Data visualization has been helping us, in a way, to see the scale of the, uh, the pandemic and, and our response to it, our fight against it. It's helped us to see the, the global extent of it and also the, the local extent of it as well. And you know, even decisions like where to travel and where might be safe and so on. All the different types uh, or you know, choices we might want to make about our behavior and so on. Um, so, Data visualization has guided us in a sense. It's been everywhere. It's been a real uh, support for our uh, journey uh, through the pandemic. And it's helped us you know, see more clearly. And as sick as we are of seeing these charts and graphics and, and various visualizations, it has basically been our ally. And it's because it has certain particular powers I want to highlight for you today. So one of the powers of visualization that supports us is, is with our thinking, helping us with scale. It's very difficult for our minds to grasp the relative sizes of things, especially things, abstract things like billions. You know, what, what does a billion dollars look like? What does a thousand billion dollars, a hundred thousand billion dollars? You know, these numbers are routinely circulated in the media and in press reports and in government spending. But they're mind-bogglingly huge, these numbers, billions. They're impossible to relate to in any everyday sense. So frustrated by this, I gather low these numbers from various sources, New York Times, Guardian, and so on, and visualize them in this chart I call the billion dollar o -gram. So the blocks here are sized according to the amounts, and the colors here represent the motivation behind the money. Green is revenue, pink is giving money away, and so on. So when you take big abstract data points like billions and you visualize them like this, you instantly have a different kind of relationship to them. You can literally see them. But more interestingly, you can start to see patterns and connections and links between numbers that would be scattered across multiple sources, you know, numbers you never necessarily see together. Let me just highlight some for you. Over here, we have the amount given to charity by the American people every year, incredibly generous people, over $300 billion a year given to charity. And you can contrast that with the amount given in foreign aid by the top industrialized nations of the world, just $170 billion. This huge stack here, this is the, tech, this is the work, personal wealth of some of the biggest tech titans of our age. We have Mark Zuckerberg at the top there, $128 billion. Bill Gates, $139 billion. I think I can resort to first names. Let's say Jeff at $195 billion. And Elon, I believe he's here at the show today, 277 billion. Now, these are 2021 figures for their wealth. And then you know the markets have been very t uh, tumultuous in the last year. And these billionaires have lost around about 30 to 60% of that wealth in the last year alone. But that's just a snapshot of their wealth. And you can contrast that with the amount it would take to lift 1 billion people out of poverty, extreme poverty, $175 billion a year there. We talked about, uh, I think Elon Musk is here uh, at the show. We hear a lot about his uh, Twitter purchase. And that number, 44 billion, that acquisition, let's see that in context, in visual context. There it is, 44 billion, relationship to other uh, big tech acquisitions of recent years. And the standout insight for me from this chart was like, what an amazing bargain Instagram and YouTube were, around about a billion each. <laughs> Tumblr, maybe not so much. So we have these billions, and they're kind of sized like blocks. You know, uh, I didn't keep adding blocks, like Lego, almost like keep adding blocks, adding numbers to this matrix uh, you know, to understand our spending going forward in the future, or to visualize historical figures to sort of comprehend our spending right now. So I could add, for example, to this diagram, the total eventual cost of the financial crisis, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. So imagine in your minds how much might be taken up by that. Let me just add it. 
Here it is, $12,000 billion that costs to the world. And of course, right now, hopefully, we're at the tail end of another global crisis, the pandemic. And today, emergency funding and bailouts has totaled around about $10,000 billion. And that number is sure to rise when there's a final reckoning, I'm, I'm sure. But right now, it's hard to imagine a figure that's larger, a discrete figure that's larger than 12,000 billion, but even that number is small compared to the amount that we discovered is hidden in offshore tax havens by the world's richest people. $26,500 billion, that's estimated to be um, conservatively. So these numbers are continually emerging. We see them in headlines, but they don't make any sense unless we actually put them in some context or comparison or, or we'll be able to see them in some way. Now, we've stepped beyond billions here. We're into the realm of trillions. 26,500 billion is, of course, 26.5 trillion. So I could take that number and situate it in a higher dimensional chart, which I like to call the trillion dollar ogram. Um, there it is right there. Lots going on here, but let me just make one contrast. We've got 26.5 trillion in the center there, offshore tax havens, contrasted with the 16.5 trillion it would take for the world to m move to renewable energies and stay below two degrees global heating or global warming. So it's one of the things I love about visualization and the power of visualization is the ability to take these abstract celestial figures, bring them down to earth, crystallize them, visualize them so we can see them and understand them, make them clear. And that highlights another power of visualization is about clarity. Taking something that's complex or technical or multidimensional and making it open and accessible and understandable and just more visual. So, for example, take someone like this. Uh, this is typically what you get from a blood test lab when you have a blood test. It's a clinical report, and you need a clinician or a doctor to explain it to you. So we put this through a visualization process. Introduce color, visual hierarchy, highlighting, we rewrote the copy, and so on. So without compromising any of the data, this document is now understandable by the clinician, the doctor, and the patient simultaneously. It's been sort of converted into this visual language, which is kind of more democratic and accessible and easier to understand. You can imagine if every government communication kind of looked like this. And the power of this, the, the accessibility of this, is maybe something to do with the way our minds work. You know, we're, uh, we're incredibly, our eyes are incre incredibly sensitive to variations in color, pattern, and shape. That's the language of the eye. And there are a huge amount of neurons in our, in our brain are just dedicated to the visual system. So if, if you're able to convert the language of the mind, numbers, ideas, words, messages, data, into the language of the eye, color, shape, and pattern, you're able to speak two languages simultaneously, each enhancing the other. And that's what's happening in a data visualization or information design. You've got two languages, both being shown. These unite, so we've got this ability, it enhances our thinking, makes things clearer, and that can lead to an unusual response to our, to our brains or our hearts, maybe even, and it can lead to hope. We can start to see things we can't normally perceive in our uh, everyday, you know, slow trends, positive movements, the kind of symphony of development as our society gets better and better, improves and improves. Uh, for example, we look at clean energy. The potential solar power is incredible. We could potentially generate about 401 million megawatt hours per day from solar power globally. What does that mean? Well, here's the entirety of humanity's electricity use per day, 63 million megawatt hours. And here's how much we're potentially using of that solar power potential, 0.5%. So there are rays of hope, literal rays of hope from this domain. And snapshots like these and pans like these and data points like these led, uh, inspired me to do a, a whole project around this, which I call Beautiful News. So in this project, we found 365 amazing, progressive, and beautiful things that were happening around the world that you can't normally see when you're fixated on the negativity of the news. These aren't newsworthy things. These are slow trends. These are beautiful upticks. These are little movements of development. So we visualized them and released a chart every single day to celebrate and surface these things. Let me just zoom in on a few. Uh, there's an amazing amount of new vaccines in the pipeline, not just the 70 or so coronavirus pandemic vaccines, but many more. And you know, other global health stories are, are positive as well. The other pandemic that's been raging for years, HIV AIDS, is now on the decline, thanks to amazing drug treatments and dedicated work from healthcare professionals. And TB as well, which we don't hear a lot about so much in the West, a massive scourge. We're seeing that decline thanks to vaccination, and other great innovations. And that's led to a broader trend that is one to celebrate, I think. Extreme poverty is decreasing around the world. Slow, slowly but surely, we're, t we're take chopping that away. And this graph is a little bit deceptive. You see this gap between 2010 and 2017. 
16% to 9.3%. That's the equivalent of 275,000 people being released from extreme poverty per day. Per day. And alongside that, we have uh, increases in support from infrastructure, more and more people getting electricity, 340,000 a day equivalent. And that's led to beautiful trends, uh, unmistakable trends like these. Life expectancy in Africa soaring, moving, going up, and then broader, widening the scope, a wider shot of something, uh, infant mortality. Fewer children are dying. The percent of children dying before the age of five has tumbled. A hundred years ago, one in three children died before the age of five. Now, it's one in 35. That is a beautiful achievement. So evidence of our progress. So that also points to another power of visualization. We can support the science or see the evidence. Uh, that can help decision making, it can help our, in our lives, it can help in our movement as a civilization. Um, but on a personal note, it particularly helped me a few years ago. I got into this, I got into this, uh, I decided I got a massive health kick basically. I decided I was going to live to 150 years old by taking loads of supplements, you know, goji berries, vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin D, and so on. Optimize my diet. Uh, but of course, I started looking at the data, and of course, you know, one day, you know, vitamin C's the best thing you can take, the next day too much it causes cancer or whatever. So frustrated by this, I gathered all the evidence for all nutritional supplements and I visualized them in this chart I call a balloon race. So the higher up the diagram, the more evidence there is for a supplement and um, the size of the bubbles is like the popularity, like a simple Google index. And this is clinical grade evidence, so large placebo controlled trials uh, and so on. So I looked at three and a half thousand studies. So I felt like I could draw a line in the diagram and say, okay, um, these supplements are worth taking, but only for the conditions listed in the bubbles. There are no universal panaceas here. And these supplements are perhaps not worth taking because the evidence is, you know, uh, inconclusive to non-existent. And about 78% of all supplements sit below this line in this $60 billion global industry. I'm having a little trouble presenting this to you. It doesn't quite fit on a slide. In fact, it just occupies two pages of a book that I created of these graphics. But again, it points to another power of visualization. There is so much research, so much um, evidence, so much data in this chart, because, uh, and it's, so it's been squeezed and compressed into a small space, just like two pages of a book. So visualization is like the MP3 of knowledge. You can compress a huge amount of understanding into a tiny space. And because I've read all the studies and processed all the data, you don't have to. So you can take this image in as you might a photograph or a landscape. You can kind of drink in the data. It becomes delicious, delectable, delightful even. And uh, talking about data, obviously every single image you see has a, a companion data set. And it means that I can treat the data as a platform and make the data into something that I can play with, become interactive, experimental, you know, exploratory. So uh, here's the interactive version of that chart. It spawns itself from that data sheet so you can New evidence comes out, I can quickly add it, and it ripples out and ripples online, so the data is alive. And because it's interactive, you can ask it questions. Is there anything effective for diabetes? Oh, uh, maybe cancer. Could there be something I could take for cancer, and so on? Well, roll over a bubble, get more info, click on a bubble, you take into the next slide, and so on. I used a similar approach for um, data breaches, a terrible fear and scourge of every country and organization and, and company in the world. These are some of the biggest ones of the last few uh, years, and you can see here, here you can explore and find your own stories in the data, like if we search by, filter by health, you can see 2009, 2010, a really bad time for healthcare industry getting hacked there, and in recent years it's healthcare insurers that have been hit. So I can swim through this data, I can play with this data, and that's why t this year we ran the World Data Visualization Prize, and we put a strong emphasis on uh, interactive entries. We gave data sets to people and we asked them, the community to invent and create and innovate. We had hundreds of entries, many of them interactive, where you could just explore, swim through, filter, find your own stories, your insights, multi-dimensional charts. And you can see through kind of clarity and some of the qualities I mentioned, clarity and beauty and uh, interactivity and playfulness. Uh, opening up what could be sort of boring data sets and, and tables and spreadsheets, the things we see every day, and bringing them al making them alive, making them become alive, almost organic, almost you know, like nature almost. Beautiful work there. And you can see some of the, the winners and the finalists in the, in the lobby. So just some of the amazing powers of visualization. And they all unite. You know, it allows us to see more clearly, allow us to uh, support our thinking, bring us hope. 
We can see all the evidence, support the science, and play with it. And the net result of that is a kind of emergent quality or a central property of visualization, which is understanding. We can suddenly see what we couldn't see before. Our minds are clear. And it's particularly helpful in, in areas where you know, we, we get foggy or we get blurred. Um, uh, for example, I would put the sort of political realm as that, the sort of left and right political spectrum. So this image is a concept map. So it shows how political ideas percolate down from governments into society and culture, into families and individuals and back round in a cycle, a political cycle. And again, like the billions at the beginning, through contrast and comparison, you can tease out the differences, subtle or not so subtle, between each side. And that's helpful because, especially in the political domain, when we don't know something about the other side, we tend to fill it with our projections, or our caricatures, or our biases. So it's helpful to be able to see what the other side stands for. Like, for example, um, on the left, it's about fair trade. But on the right, there's a focus on free trade. There's a difference. The goal at the heart of the left is personal freedom for everyone. But the goal at the heart of the right is economic freedom for everyone. There's a difference. And it's helpful because sometimes both sides, they, they, they speak about um, the same thing, but they mean different things. You know, they have conceptual dif differences. So, for example, equality on the left means a level playing field for everyone. But equality on the right means opportunity for everyone. Freedom on the left is um, freedom from power and abuse. But freedom on the right means the freedom to succeed or fail, to bootstrap yourself, to do it yourself. So both sides, they stand for quality and they fight for freedom, but they're standing and fighting for slightly different concepts. And it's maybe sometimes where the conflict comes in between them. Now, I have to admit, I felt a little conflicted making this image. You know, I'm a journalist, uh, a writer, I've written for The Guardian and so on, and I noticed as I was making this image, I really wanted that left-hand side to sound better than the right-hand side, you know? But I couldn't do that, I would have created something that was visibly lopsided, visibly biased. So as part of my process of making this image, I really had to step into that right-hand side and really honor the perspectives there and realize at the same time so how much of myself was actually in that side. It's kind of uncomfortable to recognize that, but it wasn't too uncomfortable because ultimately I was just looking at an image. There's something unthreatening about an image. You know, if somebody says to, tells me about my political views or, or about their political views, I might feel like I have to turn away or shut down. But if I see somebody's political views, I can somehow let that in. I can, you know, that, I'm open to that. And there's a clue in the language. You know when you say to someone, oh, I see what you mean. Oh, I see where you're coming from. You're telling them that somehow you've mentally visualized their viewpoint and you can relate to it. You don't have to agree with it, but somehow you can relate to it and open to it and maybe uh, let that in. So maybe there's a role for visualization in what feels like sometimes these more polarized or divided times to be able to see where somebody is coming from and see what they think. And that, to me, is beautiful. Thank you, everybody.